um, for the Letting Talk event. Um, we are um, just going to get started with the land acknowledgement. So here in Niagara on the Lake, we are meeting on the shared lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Wendat, and Chinatown people. Um, I first came to this area about four years ago, and I was welcomed here under the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Agreement. Um, this treaty was first negotiated almost a millennium ago between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee in order to ensure that everybody who lived uh, here or passed through this land would share it with others and be sure to only take what they need and leave enough for everybody else to also have um, food and shelter and supplies. We all share one dish, and in order to share it and ensure that it can sustain us um, for future generations, we must uphold the foundational principles of peace, friendship, and respect. Um, as a service provider in the Niagara region, one way I see this treaty interacting with my role here is that it sets the framework for the conditions under which we offer our services. Um, because this land is shared, um, and especially because I am a settler um, who has been welcomed here as a guest, um, I am not able to dictate who gets to access services and under what conditions. Um, more and more, it seems I see people getting turned away um, from accessing essential health care um, services and social assistance because of perceptions about the way they are behaving or living their lives, um, but it is not my job to dictate who gets access to the resources on this land and under what conditions. Um, and going a step further, I think we can understand um, that many of the negative conditions we face today, such as lack of affordable housing, food insecurity, um, the separation of families by the state, uh, policing, incarceration, um, among other things, are a direct result of the violation of the Dish with One Spoon Agreement um, so understanding the context is important to keep in mind as a service writer, but also um, as a community member as well. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about the Niagara Regional Native Center, um, which is also located here on Niagara on the Lake and provides a lot of essential programming and services for the region. Um, probably many of you here and listening online are um, from Niagara on the Lake or St. Catharines, um, and I would encourage us all to familiarize ourselves with the Native Center and support their work by showing up to public events, um, which they post updates about regularly on their Facebook page. Um, we must all act in solidarity with calls to action from indigenous leaders and communities for land back and decolonization and to reaffirm the long established foundational values of peace, friendship, and respect set out with the Dish with One Spoon agreement. So welcome again to our fourth Titillating Talks uh, event. Um, this series is part of the Niagara Skills Network Community Toolbox series and is organized in partnership with Oprah Brock, Positive Living Niagara, Out Niagara, Niagara Reproductive Justice, the Brock Graduate Student Association, Carrie Sutra, um, Niagara Reproductive Justice, the Niagara Regional and Sexual Health Centers, and of course, the Niagara on the Lake Public Library, who are our hosts today. Today we are joined by Rin Simon, who will be speaking to us about decolonization and two-spirit identity. Um, Rin is an, indig an indigenous knowledge seeker who continually strives to feed their learning spirit. Rin is of both Anishinaabe and Dutch heritage and is an off-reserve member of the Sheshaguanig First Nation on Manitoulin Island. Rin is Shikidodem Turtle Clan and identifies as two -spirit, a two-spirit member of the community. They currently live in St. Catharines and they live in a multi-generational household where they raise their child alongside their partner. Um, as someone who, uh, someone myself, um, who provides gender affirming and sexual health resources in this region, but also as a trans person myself, um, I'm familiar with the landscape here in terms of access and activism, and I am really excited to see the increased calls um, for more awareness of and access to two-spirit resources and services in this region, and I'm very excited for this talk. Um, so thank you, Ren, for joining us today. And um, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, and I'll let you take it from here. Ani, bonjour. Let the titillating begin. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to open uh, with some words in our Anishinaabe language. Abojo nindoe namaganadok. Abojo namishomis. Abojo nakomis. Abojo geshe manado. Andeg nadejnakaz. Shiken nadodem. Shishi Gwaning na Donjaba Nishna Be Nijmana Dogna Dao Miguach ni Kednango Miguach Gizas Minwa the Bakizas Gibo Ase Ashinango Wewe ne Jigano Wabak ni Jeba Mades Minwa Wewe ni Jigano Nak Miguach Skode Miguach Ake Miguach Nibish Miguach Noden Gimishian Madzoen Gimishian we sinyek 
Gimashian me Jim, you know, I'll Gimashian Wesse win. Now the motion we must go key Gabuyan, meanwhile, we Zonde Ayan. Me go at Shinando in the Maganadok. So that's, um, in essence, I am offering a prayer for our ancestors, for all of our relations through um, the earth, through the spirit world, and through creator. So I'm giving thanks to other things. So when I say Jesus and the Buck Jesus, um, you'll often hear other speakers, um, they'll say Mishomis and Nakomis as grandmother and grandfather, which is um, something we understand when we talk about our relations to those cosmic beings, the sun and the moon. I prefer to use um, less gendered terms, not to say that within my language that those terms have um, gender in the sense that we understand it today. I just prefer to step away from words that have a connotation with gendered words within English. So when I say Gizas, the buck Gizas, so I'm saying um, that sun and that moon, which is more talking about um, that it's an orb right so it's a sphere um and that i like to use that because it, it references back to some of the science that's within our language our Anishinaabe people um they say we're masters of observation and most of modern science is based off off of observation so i can only um begin to think about the way in which my ancestors saw the world and how they related to it um, and this, this heavily relates to concepts of gender. So I've titled this um, talk, Understanding Two-Spirit Identity, Decolonization and Indigenous Gender Theory. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a content disclaimer. I always, I sometimes forget to do this, um, but I wanna be mindful towards the people in the room and people who are watching online. Then I'm, I'm gonna be touching on some um, subjects that may or might not be um, hard for some people to, to discuss. So obviously right at the top I'm going to be talking about gender identity, um, gender theory, and kind of like some ideas that I have behind what gender is. Um, we're going to talk about colonialism, that fun C word. And then we're going to talk, um, there'll be talk about genocide, residential school system. I intentionally put it there in quotations because um, I am of the mind that that's a very um, poor um, word for what that whole system truly was. Um, religion and the church, racism, healthcare, suicide, sexism and heteropatriarchy, as well as intergenerational trauma, spirituality, history, and ways of knowing. So before I go on, I just want to um, acknowledge Mo for coming up here to give that land acknowledgement. Um, I always appreciate when um, non-Indigenous people come up to do this because it's not our job. I acknowledge the land and my relations every day. At least I try to. I try to go out there with my medicines. It's not. It, it's easier as the year goes on to get up at sunrise in the summer. Uh, it's a little harder because you're like 5.30. You're like, I don't really want to get up at then. But that was something that... Um, uh, is encouraged and um, was looked as a, a, a normal way of life. You get up when the sun is up, you go to bed when the sun goes down. So I like to go out there. I, I offer my, my tobacco, my semi, I either put it on the ground, um, I put it in the water, or I even offer it in a, in a smudge um, as, I'm, as I'm praying. Uh, sometimes if I feel in the way, I'll, I'll sing a song, but that's not um, always how it is. It's a very personal relationship um, with spirit that I and other Anishinaabe people have, and that's how we encourage people to think about spirituality as sort of a personal um, relationship with your own spirit, with creator and creation. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I did, um, I was expecting, um, I, I do hear it a lot, and I was listening to Dr. Deborah McGregor recently. She gave a talk last year at, I believe, York University online, where she was talking about the dish with one spoon. And um, my, my mom is present in the audience and we argue about this a little bit, which is good that, uh, that we argue about these things because we're still coming to know what these um, agreements and wampum belts um, truly mean to us in this 21st century. So one of the things she was talking about that, that um, I hadn't heard other people talk about 
was that um, there are ecological principles present within this treaty because those ecological um, principles are present in our ways of life. And um, it's, it's important to understand that this, that the dish with one spoon was specifically um, a peace agreement um, between Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people um, to end hostilities. Um, I wear this uh, beaver hat, not just because I like beavers, but because it, it pulls me back to um, some of my ancestors in the 1700s where we as Odawa Anishinaabe people were heavily involved in the fur trade. And this was a pretty, um, uh, how to say it, um, lit hat back back then. Like if you had one of these hats, you were, uh, you were uh, pretty fashionable. So I like, I like to honor my ancestors through that. So I just wanted to, to um, bring people to understand that um, the district with one spoon, although it is um, heavily influenced by indigenous ecological principles, it is primarily um, an agreement between Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. The British were allowed into this territory through the treaties of Niagara in 1764. So I heavily encourage people, if they're going to talk about the dish with one spoon, um, to go back and look through those other treaties because there's a lot, a lot of treaties um, that we have as native and non-native people. And I think it's really important to, to understand that in our relationship as indigenous sovereign people with the crown, right? We don't really have a relationship with Canada. We have a relationship with the crown. So I just want people to keep that in mind. Um... So in the vein of, I guess, politics in a way, uh, I did want to start by talking about um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I'm finding um, through my personal life that a lot of people don't actually know what's in this document. It has been accepted into Canadian law as of June 21st last year. It uh, received royal assent, the, the act. So I wanted to just showcase one of the articles. So this is Article 8. So in this article, it says, Indigenous peoples have the right to not, not to be subjugated or subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their cultures. So A, any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples or of their cultural values and ethnic identities. B, any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, territories, or resources. C. Any form of forced population transfer, transfer which has the aim or effect of violating or undermining any of their rights. D. Any form of forced assimilation or integration. E. Any form of propaganda designed to promote or incite racial or ethnic discrimination directed against them. Um, so... When I, I was I was going through them, I think there's about 44 articles in UNDRIP, and I was going through them, and I wanted to showcase one, so I was trying to think of which one I wanted to showcase, and I highly encourage everybody here to um, go home and, and read these over. They're available online free of charge to, to look at, um, and they're very much um, connected to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I believe in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they say that UNDRIP is um, a framework for reconciliation. So for Canada to, um, they've now recognized UNDRIP um, as, as law, but they have yet to implement many of the, uh, the aspects of this, which, which does include land back. Um, I wanted to showcase this because um, I, th I believe that part of this, um, especially E, so any form of propaganda um, designed to promote or incite racism and ethnic discrimination directed against them. I, I truly believe homophobia and transphobia are, are is, is a form of propaganda that's designed and promotes racial and ethnic discrimination against indigenous peoples because um, our ways of understanding ourselves through um, an Anishinaabe um, gender analysis, um, homophobia and transphobia do um, damage our culture. Because I very intentionally um, came here and wear and wore a skirt. I don't do this a lot because I, when I put this on, I do put myself in danger, just from being um, a male embodied individual wearing something that is not deemed appropriate for male embodied people to wear. So when I when I wear this, I I am propagated against through by homophobes and transphobes who want to, in in, in essence 
incite racial and ethnic discrimination against me because they don't understand who I am, what my culture is, and how I connect with my spirit. So I just wanted to showcase that. There, there's some additional information on the side here um, from an article that was published shortly after when UNDRIP was implemented into law. So two-spirit identity is uniquely indigenous. So th this is one of the, the hard rules that I say there is about two-spirit, and this is the only hard rule there is, that it's, uh, it's an intersectional identity between indigenous and gender or sexually diverse identities. So if you don't have both of those as part of your identity, then I'll ask you not to call yourself Two-Spirit. Um, right here, though, I did um, include a Anishinaabe word. So this is um, a word that was presented in, um, uh, I, I forget Patty's last name now, but she, she wrote a book called Becoming Kin. Um, it just came out kind of recently. I've been kind of diving into it. And I really like when Anishinaabe authors, they kind of center the language and the work they're doing. So um, it's, it's a little altered here because I'm from Shishiguani, so we speak an Odawa dialect and we kind of drops um, vowel sounds here and there. We're kind of lazy. That's what one of <laughs> our community elders uh, told me. And I, I'm like, yeah, I agree because we were the traders. So we had to talk fast, you know, <laughs> you didn't have time to say the whole word like those Ojibwe did. So uh, Nakina Gana. So ne, the ne denotes me, right? So I, and then kina is like everyone, right? So you'll hear some people say, oh, ani bojo kina wiya. And they're kind of saying like, hello to everybody who is present both in uh, the room, but also those um, spirits and ancestors who might be listening in on us. So that's what kina means. And then gana or gana is kind of like, um, meaning like a relative, right? So in essence, what this is kind of saying is um, I am all of my relatives, right? Because in a way, um, this, this emphasizes how Anishinaabe people view ourselves in creation as a interconnected individual piece within the broader picture. So if you can think about it as um, there's like an invisible spider web, right? And there's a line that connects us with literally everything, not just, li not just human beings, but like I'm connected to that chair, right? I'm connected to this floor. I'm connected to this microphone, to this eagle feather. So there's this invisible line of tension um, between everything. And I am all of my relations, right? Because without all of my relations, I am nothing. There's nothing for me to do. I, I cannot exist without land to stand on, right? I cannot exist without water to drink or air to breathe or the sun to keep me warm or, or that fire that would be in our wigwams to keep us warm. So... Just kind of keeping in mind a little bit about Anishinaabe philosophy and how we, we see ourselves in the broader picture. And uh, this flag here, um, I don't know who the real person is that made it. They went by Miguan, which is a Anishinaabe word for feather on Tumblr. And this is sort of an alternative uh, two-spirit flag that they created. So it features um, the colors of the medicine wheel and then this blue for that water and that green for the earth and then the sun and the moon. So I like that one. So dive in a little bit more what Two-Spirit is. So it was um, a tool, um, a community organizing tool that was created in the 1990s. I believe it's been used prior to that, but for the most part, that's when it was popularized. They had a, a indigenous gay and lesbian convention in Winnipeg. Uh, and that's where they kind of ratified it in... Um, sort of countering um, racial slurs that were used to describe um, queer indigenous people. So it is a pan-indigenous term, and it does come from Anishinaabe uh, stem, which is Nij Manadog, which just means two spirits. Um, it it's used to represent, once again, intersectionality of indigenous and gender sexually diverse identities, and it's informed through indigenous worldviews, so there's a cultural context, and it is distinct from LGBTQQIPA um, plus identities. I know, um, I don't know um, the full acronym. I do, um, in a way, apologize for using a plus because I understand that it marginalizes people um, within this acronym. And I always intend to be as inclusive as possible. But Two-Spirit is distinct from the broader mainstream or, as I've heard it said, white stream uh, identities um, because we do come from a cultural context. We do um, come from completely opposite ends of the ocean. So if you want to include Two-Spirit in your acronym, 
I, I do highly encourage, um, and it is appropriate to have the 2S as separate. So the way I always like putting it is a 2S and then a slash and then the rest of the acronym. And the reason why two spirit should go first is because first you're on our land, you're on native land. Um, two, we've been through genocide. And three, the Indian Act still regulates indigenous gender identity. There's no space in the Indian Act for two spirit people. You're either a man or a woman. And uh, there's a lot of sexism and heteropatriarchy within the Indian Act. Um, so if you don't know much about the Indian Act, I highly suggest uh, looking into it. It's um, very disturbing. A lot of things. I'm, I'm not going to get into the Indian Act, though, because that's a whole different talk. So I like to have this slide to talk about worldviews a little bit. So on this side here, so this is a this is a medicine wheel. So this is a medicine wheel like this is a little more pan indigenous. As Anishinaabe people, we didn't have a medicine wheel until um, the 20th century. That's what um, I think he is from Wallapol Island. I was reading um, Doug Williams was talking about this. How um, when he was growing up a as a kid. Um, they just talked about it in the four directions, right? So we have this philosophy of four directions. We have the east, Wabanong, Jawanong, the south, Ipingishmong, uh, the west, and Giwidnong, which is the north. So within this medicine wheel, so this is shared by um, Jim Dumont, who was Martin Clan, I believe, from Shawanaga, um, which is a little north, I think, past, not past Sudbury, but it's it's kind of between here and Sudbury. But... um. He, he shared this basic, these basic teachings in the medicine wheel. So we have the seeing path, ways of relating, coming to know, and ways of doing. So I'm not going to dive into all of these teachings because this could take a long time. Um, they say there's seven teachings within each section, and then they subdivide within there. So there's a lot of teachings within the medicine wheel, but I like to use it as a framework as I do my research into my own personal identity and my culture. So the way... I, I would like people to look at this right now is I, I had titled this understanding to spirit identity, right? So I'm, I'm hoping that people, we start in the East, that they have some awareness that two spirit is a thing, right? So then when we move down to the South, this is about understanding. You come to understand things about who we are as two spirit people. And then you come to know things. So you gain knowledge, right? And through knowledge is action, right? So you're responsible for, for all aspects of this medicine wheel. You're responsible to make yourself aware of things. You're responsible to understand things. You're responsible to, to gain that knowledge. And with that knowledge, you're responsible to create action, right? So that's that's how I would like people to look at this right now. Um, a, a whole medicine wheel talk is a, is a totally different uh, talk entirely. I used to have them um, both part of this slideshow and then it just got way too big. And <laughs> so I had to separate them into two different talks. So on this side here, this was just auto-generated by PowerPoint. I kind of liked how it looked. So we have our ways of life, our spirituality, our connection to land and language. And this is what uh, contributes to our culture um, as Indigenous peoples or um, sort of just like the, the makeup of, of who we are and what we believe in. So this is um, on utilizing Indigenous methodologies. Once again, Indigenous methodologies could be a whole talk in and of itself. So I like to use this one by um, uh, Kathleen uh, Absalon, um, who published a book called Kondozuin, which in the language kind of means uh, it's coming to know things, right? Like in education, like you're becoming educated, you're knowing things um, and sort of like the methodological um, search for that. So, so in this, what she presents is she uses um, a flower petal and this is, um, I guess, um, kind of a staple of Nishinaabe and other um, indigenous methodologies is that we look to nature um, for for guidance, right? So within the book, she talks about how um, she was given a dream of, of a petal flower and it was whispering to her, right? And then she woke up and she um, came up with this um, petal flower um, holistic framework for understanding indigenous methodologies, which is about a search for knowledge. So how do we um, gain knowledge, right? So she starts down here at the roots which is about us being grounded in land. As, and as indigenous peoples and our nations, our nations are very well rooted in this land, even though we've been displaced, even though we've been genocide against, our roots still dig deep into this land. So I'm Anishinaabe and Dutch. So the way I see it 
is my Dutch roots are like these little things that have been here. I'm a, a second generation immigrant on my dad's side, which is a wild thing to think about being indigenous, but also being a second generation immigrant on one side. So, um, but so it's like these little, little baby roots. And then our Anishinaabe roots, we've been here thousands of generations. They just go like you go from like the ceiling to the floor. Like that's how deeply rooted our Anishinaabe worldviews are in the land and why land is so important to us because it literally, it's like a feedback loop. It feeds us as uh, as we um, give thanks in that way and, and gain knowledge. And then we move straight up to the center, which is about us, right? So we center ourselves in our search because that's who we are as individuals and sort of understanding our po uh, positionality within creation. And then we have the leaves, which if you understand a little bit about plant biology, those leaves, they photosynthesize and they, they feed um, the whole thing. So this represents the journey, your process and transformations through, through knowing things. Cause like when you start to learn things about the world around you, you don't stay the same, you change. And then, uh, we have the stem, which is sort of a backbone. So this is about our, what sort of methodologies we're using and who's supporting us. Um, we have the petals now, which are, are all of our diverse ways of searching for knowledge. So uh, an example, like I, I use the medicine wheel as a way to search for knowledge, and so that could be one pedal for me. I use my language. Um, I use books, YouTube, podcasts, all those things. So however you find knowledge, that, that makes up sort of your pedal. And there's so many different ways and diverse ways. Um, just think about how many flowers are out there, right? And that's how many ways there are for searching for knowledge. And then six is sort of your environment. So what sort of environment are you in? So um this, this book is great. She goes into much more detail than, than I can. Um, but I just wanted to show um, an example of indigenous methodologies. So now I'm going to be moving into some history. So misrepresentations of, of two spirits in uh, the Euro Western historical tradition. Um, so we have the use of the derogatory term, uh, term Burdash. So this is not a term that is used anymore i don't think i don't see it really used ever um but if you're going back reading things from the 90s and 80s you're going to see this used a whole lot um it, it essentially it comes from persian roots persian language roots and it means a kept boy or a male prostitute so it's it's derogatory in the sense that it entirely misrepresents um two-spirit identity um some issues with doing research into historical two-spirit peoples is that there's a very small sample size of historical records and it leads to a lot of speculation, right? So it, it can only do, when we're looking through history as two-spirit people on who our two-spirit ancestors were, it can only do so much for us because there there is such a limited amount that's written on them. And most of what's written about them have a lot of attitudes for homophobia, heteronormativity, heteropatriarchy, and these kind of um, attitudes are still present today in the historical record and they persist into real life. So even within our own indigenous communities, um, there is still a lot of homophobia and transphobia and other things like that. Um, so this misrepresentation um, in history contributes to the reinforcement and recreation of homophobic and transphobic attitudes and social relations uh, that contribute to the negative economic health and wellness outcomes of two-spirit folk. There is a lot of research that is done uh, or has been done um, on indigenous peoples in general in terms of economics, health, and wellness, um, but not a lot that's focused specifically on two-spirit people. The only thing that we can really point to in terms of how two-spirit folk fit into it is that we are usually the, the top of those um, categories, like um, like access to healthcare, you know, very limited access to healthcare, living in very poor economic situations, especially, and these are all exacerbated when we're talking about two-spirit people on reserves or in rural areas. Um, I can say that I guess I'm fortunate to be an urban two-spirit person because I don't have to deal with the issues that I see um, um, on reserve two-spirit people have to deal with. So I'm going to present some examples of the historical record. So this is, um, once again, we don't use this word. This is a derogatory worm, uh, word. Um, employment of the hermaphrodites. So this was um, a painting of an eyewitness account by French colonizer Jacques Le Mans de Morgues in 1564. So the guy who painted this did not see it, which kind of um, emphasizes why these people look very European in a sense. They're very light-skinned. Um, 
But the the painting shows what Le Mans and other European colonizers at the time called hermaphrodites because they were male embodied individuals who were assuming um, more feminine or female roles in society. So in this example, um, they were carrying the wounded and injured off the the field of battle. So in a sense, the the European, the French European colonizers um, thought of this as a servile and degrading role. Um, but I like to counter it as like if you're a, a battlefield medic, you have a lot of uh, knowledge in terms of uh, physiology, biology, um, plant medicines, um, how to set a bone if somebody's bone got broken. Like that's not easy stuff to do, especially like they didn't have x-rays back then. Um, different sort of spiritual healing, singing songs and other things. And also just having the physical strength to carry people off the field of battle. I, I, if you notice in the back there, there's somebody literally having people on their backs carrying them away so through the european colonizers uh viewed the yeah they viewed these people's roles as servile and degrading um other gender people would have been revered and respected by their communities per, for possessing gifts and had a place in traditional spiritual and ceremonial practices so i'm kind of going forward in time so that was in the the 1560s this one is the 1800s. So this is Dance of the Bird Ash. Once again, we don't use that word. So this was painted by George Catlin sometimes between 1835 and 37. We're not completely sure because he kind of like went a little um, a little haywire back then. Um, he was of the mind that um, indigenous people were going to vanish and that he was uh, had a prime opportunity to document us in paintings before um, we uh, died out. So in this painting, he captured a ceremony while visiting um, the Sac and Fox tribe. Um, so in this ceremony, um, Pruden Harlan talks about uh, talked about this in, in a way that I hadn't heard anybody else talk about it. But essentially what this ceremony was, was uh, a war procession. So there, you have all these warriors out here and they're dancing around this two-spirit person, right? Who is a male embodied individual who is wearing fe uh, more female defined clothing, a dress in this case. So George Catlin saw this as, as very um, unacceptable, right? So he wrote, this is one of the most unacceptable and disgusting customs that I have ever met in Indian country. And I should wish it, it being the Burdash, might be extinguished before, uh, uh, before it be more fully recorded. So that's sort of some of the attitudes um, towards two-spirit people at the time and why we weren't heavily documented or recorded because they didn't like us. They didn't like that we didn't subscribe to European gender roles or that we didn't enforce gender hierarchies within our societies, which of course um, the church did wonderful work at making sure that we did do that kind of stuff. So within the ceremony, and this is important because this two-spirit person holds political power within the community. Essentially, these warriors have to dance around the two-spirit person and you can see that this two-spirit individual is looking directly at you away from the warriors. And this is intentional because they're trying to get the attention of that two-spirit. And the two-spirit can decide whether or not they go to war, essentially based on whether or not um, they notice a warrior or not, right? So this two-spirit person had the political power within their community to say yes or no to these warriors going to war. And those warriors would have to respect that. So one of the most well-documented um, two-spirit individuals in the historical record is Wewa of the Zuni Nation. So they lived sometime between 1849 and died of a heart attack in 1896. So in their language, I'm, I'm not Zuni, so I don't know if I'm saying this right, but they would call them a Lamana, which is a male embodied individual who assumes more feminine roles in community. Um, but Wewa was um, very much a person who could go back and forth freely between um, both, um, both sides in that case, where they could assume female responsibilities in community, but also male responsibilities in community. Um, they um, were very politically active in their community. They spent a lot of time with anthropologists and teachers, soldiers, and other white folk just coming through the land and would educate them about um, Zuni issues, Zuni culture and spirituality, um, which is why they're one of the most documented two-spirit folk out there. Um, they were also part of a Zuni delegation to Washington, D.C. to meet President Grover Clevefield, I think, in 1886. So they had a very, um, a very important political position within the community, and they were considered a master weaver and renowned artist. 
Um, do, do, do. I like to show this video. So I'm kind of going, I kind of start really far back in time and now I'm coming more to the present. So this is a uh, sort of a more, uh, I guess you can say famous um, two spirit person in, in today's context. Uh, Dr. James McCocus um, did win uh, the amazing race um, with their, their partner um, a couple years ago now. So I really like the work they do. I don't know if we have time to show the whole video, so I'm just going to kind of uh, summarize in a way. Um, but I do highly encourage um, folks to go and watch this video. So Dr. James McCocus, um, within this video, focuses on their practice as a healthcare practitioner in rural Alberta. So they're, they're Cree from Alberta. And they talk about the struggles that Two-Spirit Folk on Reserve have. And they kind of follow... Um, the journey of a, a young two-spirit person who is transitioning and sort of how the, the use of uh, hormonal therapy has increased um, their, their wellness, right? They, they started off being suicidal and depressed and anxious and not feeling like they fit into not only their community but their own body, um, which I I'm, don't necessarily consider myself trans, but I do understand elements of gender dysphoria. Um, most of my issues with gender dysphoria relate to how other people perceive me. It's not so much of uh, me thinking my body is misaligned with my gender. I'm quite um, comfortable with the body creator has given me. It's more about how other people perceive me based on my body and how they want me to fit into certain categories and and behave in, in a sense. So I, I highly encourage people look into Dr. James uh, McCocus and um, sort of his practice. Um, they end off talking about like having two spirit um, sharing circles and other things, which I, I'm very um, happy to say that we're, we're looking to start at NRNC. So if there's any um, two spirit folk who um, hear this talk, um, second week in November, we're, we're going to be having a uh, two-spirit sharing circle with one of our two-spirit community elders. So, and I, and I am trying to be um, in a way where I'm saying, please, only two-spirit people show up because <laughs> sometimes we do want our own spaces. Um, that is our, our right to have our own spaces as two-spirit people. All right, next slide. Oh, the fun part. So now I get to talk about language. So I love language. Um, just a disclaimer, um, I didn't finish university. <laughs> I took a few I took a few courses and one of my favorite courses was through anthropology. So I took um, physical and cultural anthropology and part of cultural anthropology is linguistics, which I find absolutely fascinating, especially as I am uh, learning my language. So right, right here, um, I have a, a quote by Wade Davis, who is a non-Indigenous person, but he does he has spent a lot of time with Indigenous people and is somebody who I believe does kind of get it. <laughs> so he says in his book, The Wayfinders, um, a language is not merely a set of grammatical rules or vocabulary. It is a flash of the human spirit, the vehicle by which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of the spiritual possibility. So in, in this lecture that he's giving, he's kind of talking about this concept. So of uh, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. So you know how we have like a, a stratosphere and other things like that. So he, he brings up this concept of an ethnosphere, which is sort of about um, culture and how it relates to the ecology of areas. So... If you look at um, settler colonial Canadian society and its culture and its um, ideals of private property and capitalist modes of economics, you can really see how that has an effect on the land. Um, our ways of being as Anishinaabe people uh, is very much to not leave a trace, right? We would always do our best to walk gently on our mother, the earth, because we understand that the earth gives us life and that if we don't um, respect it as a living thing, then we are in essence not respecting our own lives and that our lives would come to an end if we ever um, damage the earth in such a way that it cannot sustain life. 
So language diversity does matter. So like right here, I have a picture. So this is like of an old growth forest. Um, you can see these giant trees. They still have some in BC and California. Um, there are indigenous people out there in BC right now fighting for their land, for their water, for their trees, for their animal relations and their and their fish that they rely on. So, and then we have a picture here of it cut down and it's just, it really, it really does affect my, my spirit and my heart in a lot of ways when I see the ecological devastation that's happened because um, it, it, it limits our capacity to um, act in a, in a cultural way as indigenous people. We're, we're very much as urban people, as urban indigenous people, we're very reliant on um, settler ways of being, you know, we drive cars, uh, we use our debit cards and <laughs> we go to the bank and other things like that. But we never needed that when we were on the land, right? Because the land would sustain us through those fish, through those plants, um, through through the health of the water and the air. Um, a lot of that stuff um, we don't have anymore, right? So we can't take that for granted. So there's about 7,000 languages that exist globally. More than 50 are critically endangered. So I believe for a language to be critically endangered, um, they, the criteria is that there's less than a hundred speakers, fluent speakers. Um, most of them are elderly or, um, middle aged, and there aren't a lot of young people who are learning the language. So I believe that's the criteria for an endangered language. And we do have endangered languages in this area. Um, I know we, uh, recognized, uh, the Haudenosaunee as, as part of that dish with one spoon agreement. And I, I looked at the stats from Six Nations and I think 80% of their speakers are, are Mohawk speakers. So Mohawk seems to be um, in, in a better place than their other languages. Their other languages, they have very few speakers. So if you can um, uh, support those other languages in any way, then, then please do because they, they are endangered languages. So there's more than 80% uh, more than of uh, global speakers use only one of 83 most used languages. So I didn't add a calculation there, but I think that's like, what, like less, like 1%, a little more than 1% uh, of all the, of 80% of people, or sorry, I'm, I'm bad at math sometimes. <laughs> so 80% of, of people in the world speak only one of 83 languages. So I, I'm speaking one of those languages right now. Um, people in Quebec speak another one of those languages, you know. So and just to think about like sort of the how language allows you to access different ways of being in relationship um, most people only relate in one of 83 ways when we have over 7,000 ways of relating so before um, colonization of Turtle Island um, there were a hundred and fifty million upwards of 150 million people who lived here within less than two generations um, 90, 90% of our population, uh, died of plague or direct contact with colonization. I, I know that, uh, Columbus day in the States passed recently, and it's very triggering, uh, to hear U S politicians, uh, talk about Columbus as, as being this great man, this great historical figure when in Less than two years, I believe, he he and his uh, small group of men um, killed more or killed about two or three million people in a span of two years when they first came here. Um, and it's it's and people just don't quite understand the veracity of that. And and there were accounts of them killing specifically two spirit people. They would let their dog they would stick their their dogs on them and let their dogs tear them to bits. So we, we are in the historical record and a lot of times it's, it's not very, um, pleasant. The, the outcomes that we find, um, I know there was, I forget their names, but there was, um, a two spirit couple who did, um, was arrested with, um, Geronimo and, uh, one of them ended up passing of tuberculosis shortly after. But the other one um, lived on and always remembered her partner very fondly. So um, there, there, there's a lot of um, sadness in the historical record when it comes to um, two-spirit people. So a lot of the work um, we're involved in right now is a lot of healing and wellness and 
um, just helping our, our two spirit siblings come more into the light. Um, so then the last um, piece of information I have on language diversity is on average, every two weeks, a language goes extinct. So just, just being mindful of that. All right, so gender and sexual diversity and variance in Anishinaabe Moen. So this is from uh, Roger uh, Rowlett from a CBC um, revisioning quest in July 20th of 2011. So in this, he presents um, some words in the language um, because he's being asked about, you know, inclusive language with, with an Anishinaabe Moen. So here we have um, at the top, uh, we should damagan so that's saying like they cohabit with a person like i'm saying like somebody they they cohabit with a person and then we pemagan so they sleep with a person right and this doesn't necessarily mean um sexual relations just means that they share a sleeping space with them uh we jiwagan so a friend or companion we jikwe magan so that's a woman whose partner is another woman and we jinnimagan so a man whose partner is another man so on the other side here, I have um, Anishinaabe Moan concepts of uh, gender variance. So this is where um, I, I can, I kind of want to counteract some of these previous words that I said, because within our language, we don't have words that mean woman or man, right? Those, those are terms that were put on us um, by um, French Catholic missionaries. So ikwe is often um, attributed to as meaning woman. But when we start to translate things from Anishinaabe Moan into English as a one-to-one -one term, uh, we lose a lot of the meaning because within our words, um, we've kind of weaved in um, our spiritual, mental, and physical relationship to the, what that word means. So there's like three parts to every word that we talk about. And it's kind of hard to conceptualize when your brain is working in English because English is a very noun-based language when our language is very or verb-based, so very um, descriptive of what something is doing. I think I use that word, verb. I sometimes forget which one's which. <laughs> but um, it's a very descriptive language. So when we say ikwe, we're describing something. When you say woman, um, there's a lot of... Um, different um, takes on what that means to different people. Um, when you say man, it also, it's it's not a very descriptive word because it it can mean so many different things. But when we say anine and ikwe, what we're really talking about is, is a person's role and responsibilities within and to community. So to say man or woman, it doesn't add up because man and woman, you, you don't, un, there's no um, inherent roles or responsibilities within them. People kind of create them within uh, society. So when we say ikwe kazo, that means becoming ikwe, right? That kazo means becoming. So in a sense, we can understand that as a, a male embodied individual, like physiologically male, um, taking on more of what they would consider those, those feminine roles. And once again, like when I'm describing this, I don't even like using the terms male and female because that's, that's, we didn't have those concepts, right? Like we understood um, physiology and biology in terms of like um, the words nabe and nage. So nabe means like a physical male of a species, like in, in terms of its body. And nage means like physically a female of its species, right? So I, I kind of think about it like the, a, a buck and a, and, a, and a doe sort of. So we have those concepts, but man and woman just don't fit into it. And we actually have way more terms than just what they want to attribute to man and woman. So we have like in ni kazo, which could be understood as once again, a female embodied individual taking on uh, more masculine roles in society, such as hunting or going on war parties or participating in, in certain um, uh, more masculine ceremonies. Um, and then we have a gokwe or a gokwe in ninito which is kind of like they, they translate it to mean like wise woman. But once again, I, I, I do um, consciously try and steer away from using man and woman. Then we have Nij, Nijin Ojijak, which is more of an Ojikri. So the Ojikri are uh, mixed communities of Ojibwe and Cree people that uh, live in the north. And uh, this one does more mean like two spirits or Ojijak means kind of soul. 
um which is kind of funny because in in our language i think this is more of a cree influence because within our language uh ojijak means uh what we call a crane so unless you got you have two cranes in you but <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna tell that to one of our uh, our cree language speakers see what she has to say about that but uh and then we have getcha go which is getcha means like big or great um and then uh the quay again so it's more like a, a, a feminine sort of understanding so the way i like to talk about it um so when we have these feathers here um this megazem iguan so an eagle feather um and all feathers um they have that stem in the middle so that stem is what represents our life path right and it holds us together so that that is us as an individual but we both everybody has that male and masculine side to them but it's just about how they relate to it so the way i like to think about it without using the terms male and female i think about that sun and that moon so i think about it as a warmth and a coolness right there's a warmth and a coolness because we um because that's sort of uh trying to unlock some of the things that we've lost along the way as Anishinaabe people, um, we're, we're very pushed forward by our, our prophecies. And the term prophecy is kind of uh, limiting in a way. When um, these fires were given to us, um, they were given to us as things that were yet to come. So a long, long time ago, um, there were um, seven um, what they call prophets. They would have been medicine people. Who came to our to came to our people before we were Anishinaabe. So our history as a people, we started on that west coast, right? We actually started in what they call California now. And as that ice sheet began to recede during the last ice age, we began to travel upwards, right? We traveled. Uh, we wanted to travel to um, the land of the rising sun, which is what we call Wabanong, right? It's that direction of where that sun rises. So when we were traveling there, we split into a lot of different groups, right? Because we were all trying to find this place that creator um, had created for us. Um, and we traveled up east all the way to the furthest east we can go until we came to that great water, that ocean. And uh, we decided to settle there for a while. So after a while, these, these uh, medicine people came to us and uh, they say there were seven, but there were eight fires given to us. And one of those people came as two people. So it's sometimes speculated that that one uh, medicine person was a two-spirit person because they presented two fires um, to the people instead of just one. So when they presented these fires, um, one of them was about us needing to travel um, back west, right? We were given one where um, they're talking about new people coming from across the water and that we'd have to be ready and that there were um, those two outcomes where either um they'd come in friendship and we'd be able to combine our knowledge together and live as one or they would come with uh with a facade of friendship right and we were told to look out for those uh those things they carried those weapons um and for their greed so we were told to watch out for that and i think uh if anybody has a, a little bit of history knowledge i think we can figure out which one they ended up coming with so uh it's more of a facade so us Anishinaabe people, we broke away from the people on the East Coast. Um, so that's how we're related to uh, Mi'kmaq people. Um, we're relatives as nations. And uh, it's even present in the language. Our languages are related. Um, we're part of the broader Algonquian uh, language family. So I've even noticed, um, looking at some Mi'kmaq words, um, there's some similarities between Anishinaabe Moan and, and the Mi'kmaq language, just like there is with Anishinaabe Moan and, and uh, Cree language. And many other languages, I think there's about 20, 20 plus languages within the Algonquian language family, all the way out west, all the way to those mountains. So it's, it's really interesting kind of diving into um, how we're all related through language and land as, as uh, indigenous peoples here. So we traveled west um, to that land where the food grows on the water. So we knew we came to where we were supposed to be when we found that monomen, which is that wild rice. It grows in in, uh, in lakes and other things. And uh, we used to harvest a lot of that. There's still communities that do, but most of the harvesting is done by non-indigenous peoples now who have uh, encroached on our lands and territories, um, taking away access to our traditional foods. The thing about monomen too, it's a really, uh, it's a really good rice because it's not um, a carbohydrate, it's a protein. 
So it's really good for uh, for the winter and other things when you don't have as much access to meat. So um, that's kind of, I was talking about Monoma and I got hungry. So <laughs> it's really good if you never had it. Like it's so, it tastes so good. I know my daughter loves it. So this, this next slide. So this was, um, it's really tiny down there, but this was designed by Awana Gijic Bruce and translated by Kai Pyle Manado Miangan uh, and Charles Lippert. So this is um, some of the terms that we would use in Anishinaabe Moan uh, to denote different um, gendered roles. And once again, I'm coming back to this, this issue that I have with, with how we use words. And I don't like using the word gender. Within our language, we, we don't have gender. Gender does not exist. So I like to say all Anishinaabe people um, are non-binary because we did not live in a binary system. Um, as you can see, we all lived in a circle. So if you can kind of imagine superimpose um, a circle over all of these people here with their different terms, we all sat within that circle and we were all equals within the circle. There's no top, bottom. Um, it's not a hierarchy like how um, they sit us in, in society now. So there's, there's upwards of, of 20 terms within Anishinaabe language that denote different roles and responsibilities in society. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to talk about is, so when we talk about European languages like French or German or Italian or something, they have uh, gender terms. Like in French, we have uh, les, la, les. In German, there's der, die, uh, and das. So they, they denote gender, which in a linguistical stance, it's not like we're saying like in German, we say uh, uh, das Hund or uh, das bus, which is a, a neutral term. We're not saying that um, the dog or the bus doesn't have a gender. It's more related along the lines of genre or genus of words. So that's sort of like diving into um, sort of what it means when, when we say we gender things in European languages. So in Anishinaabe Moan, we didn't gender things along male and female. What what you'll hear Anishinaabe people talk about is that we gendered things along the lines of animate and inanimate. So, for example, I have a drum here. So we would say dewe igun, right? If you have multiple drums, you'd say dewe igun nug, right? So you add a, a g, a kind of g to the end to pluralize it, and um, and that's because it's an animate thing. When I when I talk about my drum, my dewe uh, igun, it it is a living thing, right? Dewe igun. Um, more or less literally translates to a living heart, a living heartbeat um, through resonance. And it's an instrument by which we can um, expand our own heart. So once again, like I say a very short word, they wait again, but it has a, a lot. It's like sentences and sentences and paragraphs of what that really means in English. So when we say uh, noggin, which is, uh, which is what we call a bowl, it's really referring, once again, it's descriptive. So what we're describing is sort of the basin, right? It's like a basin, so nagan. And we say naganun, right? Because it's not animate. It doesn't have motion in and of itself, right? It can't move itself. Um, that's where we have a difference with the drums. If you hang around these drums long enough, you'll notice that they do move and they do have motion in and of themselves. Um, I was uh, sitting in a, in a room with one of my colleagues and we had the big drum in there and we were talking about something. We heard a little ping, right? We were like, hey, look around. He's like, what, what the heck was that? And I was like, oh, it's just the drum, you know. They do move around by themselves. They do their own things, um, especially when you're not looking. So <laughs> it's okay. Uh, they just do that. <laughs> but um, a noggin, right, a bowl, a bowl in and of itself doesn't have motion, right? So it's uh, considered an inanimate. But one thing that, uh, that I read from uh, Dr. Cecil King of uh, Wikwemakong, the way he describes it, I like the way he describes it a little better because he talks about it as not animate and inanimate, but animate and less animate. So everything, and once again, this is going back to the science of it all, everything has, uh, is, has motion in and of, of itself. When, when I pray and I'm saying, miigwech gi mishion we say when, right? I'm talking, I'm saying, thank you for giving me breath, right? What that breath is, is that motion 
that is given to me to express myself through a physical form. Because I, I am a spiritual being when my physical body um, eventually gives out on me and it re has to return to the earth, my spirit will live on, right? So that breath is what gives me that motion. And everything has breath, everything has motion, right? Even these chairs in front of us, these books, these grounds, we, we understand that we're on a spinning sphere, right? So everything is moving with the earth. And even when we break things down to like the, the atoms and the molecules within it, those atoms and those molecules are constantly in motion. And that's what kind of holds everything together. Without motion, um, there, there, is, there is no existence. And that's how um, I kind of uh, relate more personally with creators, understanding Gishe Manado, that great spirit, as that source that gives me and all of creation motion, right? So we can understand that all the way back to the Big Bang and sort of the expansion of the universe, how galaxies spiral around themselves, why we spiral around the sun on the earth, and why we do things in a circle as indigenous peoples. So yeah, I guess that's a kind of a spiel about language. Um, how much time do I have left? I feel like I haven't done this in person, so I feel like I'm talking really fast. 10 minutes? Okay. All right, because I, 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 I have some sources. I did um, um, add some more sources. So I, I recommend, you might even have some of these in the library here. I recommend <laughs> taking some of them out and reading them. Um, Brian Rice, Seeing the World with Aboriginal Eyes. That's the one that uh, I like to pull from. Um, it kind of gave me a foundational um, base for understanding medicine wheels. Once again, Condozoin by Kathleen Absalon. Great book. I'm just I'm just plugging books because I love books. <laughs> the Wayfinder, Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World. Uh, Minado Bamasing Bama Dizawin, Reclaiming, Reconnecting and Demystifying Resilience as Life Force Energy for Residential School Survivors. Uh, Leanne Simpson. Um, Leanne, if you're watching this, I love your book. <laughs> but uh, as we have always done, she, she wrote a chapter um titled indigenous queer normativity um where she she talks about a lot of our land-based practices and how um it, it's very open right in all honesty the way um some people talk about indigenous cultures is like oh this is what the boys do this is what the girls do it's not true because as as Anishinaabe people we were um socialized to know both things to know everything how to take care of that right how to do that inside the wigwam like taking care of that how to go out and hunt because you had to be self-sufficient on the land you didn't always have um the the privilege of relying on a community sometimes you're from really small communities during times of colonialism sometimes um there were plague outbreaks like a priest would show up to a community and then over the winter more than half the community uh would die from tuberculosis or smallpox or other things like that so um, if all the men in your community died, right, or all those male embodied individuals died, um, you the community didn't just all die because nobody knew how to hunt. Like uh, those people knew how to hunt, right? They knew how to trap, they knew how to fish, they knew how to create tools. Everybody knew how to do everything that they needed to be self-sufficient on the land and be in relationship with the land. So, um, oh yeah, the, um, Patty uh, Krowek, I'm sorry, Patty, if I mispronounced your name but i i did put her on here because i've been i've been reading her book i'm still not done it but it, it is very interesting and i i like a lot of the points she brings up especially um you know taking on the the task of trying to talk about indigenous ways of knowing um while being mindful of her christian upbringing which i can relate to because i was brought up in in christian church um and was was raised to be a christian and eventually uh had a falling out, so now I'm uh, very much on on a journey of uh, self discovery and and diving into culture and language because it, it is so much deeper um, than the Christian Church was ever able to give me. Um, so I'm kind of uh, in a way thankful that I um, fell away from the church. Um, some other ones, so like Harlan Pruden, um, LGBTQ two well being education to spirit people then and now, which is um, a slideshow on the Indian Health Service um, website, um, Friedrich Baraga. So this is a, a, a dictionary of the Ojibwe language. Um, it's a reprinting, but this was the 
first comprehensive dictionary ever published on our language back in the 1850s by um, Frederick Barriga, who was um, some sort of, I don't remember what kind of missionary he was. I don't think he was Catholic. I think he might have been Protestant. Um, but yeah, he, he wrote, he made this dictionary so other uh, priests could come in uh, proselytize and preach to us. So, but it's, it's useful um, in the sense that it, it has a lot of old words in it, like what what we call like sleeping words in this, words that people don't use anymore or people or words that people haven't heard in a long time. So we can kind of like revitalize those words in sort of our language and understanding what how they fit into a, a contemporary context. So Roger Roulette um, on Revision Quest, who was talking about um, non-judgmental words or how Anishinaabe Moan is non-judgmental um, towards um, sexual and gender diversity. Um, Jennifer C. Nash, Rethinking Intersectionality. I read that one recently. I know some people, they don't like um, referencing um, stuff that's a little older, but as a young person, I like to look back at what um, the generation behind me had to say about different things. Um, uh, Glenn Coulthard, Red Skin, White Masks, Rejecting Colonial Politics of Recognition. So this is uh, kind of a, a fundamental um, political text um, trying to understand indigenous politics, especially under uh, a liberal government as we in or as we are, um, which he kind of points uh, to to a lot of different things. But my one of the things I like to use um, in this sort of research, understanding two spirit identity, is um, this concept of grounded normativity. How our culture, our languages, and our ways of life were always grounded in the land. Like that was that that first relationship that we learned um, to develop, and everything kind of jumps from there it, it all it bounces from the land so if we want to revitalize ourselves as two-spirit people as and as indigenous peoples then we need to be able to be on the land and be in relationship with the land and understand it as a framework of relationships where or like a matrix of relationships where everything is there right like all those animals all those plants those different elements and and the spirit of it all um, and this one down the bottom, this was the federal UNDRIP bill becoming law that I referenced earlier. And that's kind of it. I think I spoke really fast. So usually uh, I'm going over time, but this is my first time doing it in person in a while. So I'm just a little bit nervous, but <laughs> yeah, thank you. Miigwech. Nyawa. Next part. Questions. Question time. Yeah, don't don't be afraid to talk on the mic. Your list. We are going to share them with the along with the YouTube video. So when we upload the YouTube video in a couple of days, we'll make sure to include that. Yeah. Oh, my mom has a question. Um, I just wanted to know if you could, um, the, the previous slide with the Ikwe and the... And in, this one? Uh, yeah. Um, I didn't really understand. Could you explain the other names and how they're... Oh, this you want person me to described? Yeah, so I don't really know. So this is part of uh, the, the relearning and researching. So um, as people, as youth of the seventh fire... Our, our job, our task is to go back along the path and find um, those things that were left for us by our ancestors, which includes the language. So learning um, some of these words, like I, I really don't know what, what they describe in a lot of cases. Like I understand kazo means like becoming, right? Like that, I, I know that much, but I don't know a lot of what these specific terms mean and how they relate to community because as, as urban indigenous peoples, we don't have um, the same style of community that we would have had um, even a hundred years ago, right? Even 200 years ago, like a hundred years ago, we weren't even allowed to leave the reservation without a pass, without confirmation from Indian affairs, you know? Like we couldn't even go, you couldn't even go visit your cousin. Like you, <laughs> if you were in a group of two or more, uh, you could be arrested and imprisoned or fined, so. Um, I'm not really sure what a lot of these mean. I'm very interested 
if um, there are language speakers out there who know what these mean, I would be very appreciated. I would give you that sema and, and ask you to go over these with me because I am trying to find my uh, my own way of identifying within the language. Because when we say two spirit, um, that's not a traditional um, role within a community because what it is, is it's a tool for us to kind of explore um, roles and responsibilities within community uh, in a contemporary context um, in a settler colonial state. So Two-Spirit just kind of allows us to explore that and it kind of is a filler term uh, for now. So if I, when I eventually find um, the right word within the language for me and I understand it and I'm given um, those teachings on roles and responsibilities, then I will identify with that. But until then, I'm just going to stick with Two-Spirit because I'm not a man and I'm not a woman because I re fully reject colonial um, gender binaries and stereotypes and what have you. Just, just fully reject it. So, yeah. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much. That was such an amazing presentation. Um, we just have a question from somebody online. Um, what are the... Uh, what are some of the most impactful ways for queer and trans settlers to engage in meaningful allyship? Um, I think one of the best ways is to not intrude on our spaces because even though we do have a commonality in terms of our identity as gender and sexually diverse people, um, we are distinct. Like as I went over, we our identity stem from... Um, generations, hundreds of thousands of year old traditions on um, understanding our, our how societies work, right? So don't expect to be able to walk into two-spirit places if you're not two-spirit. If you're uh, like, we can welcome you in, but that's, that's our decision to make, right? As two-spirit people, we are self-determining individuals and a self-determining collective who can decide who is or is not in our community. And it sort of it begins from a local and then kind of spirals out from there. Uh, I hope, does that kind of make sense? But always like, yeah, when we, when we do call outs and we're like, hey, like we need our allies to show up, like show up. Like that's that's the least you can do, especially since you're on our land. So. Okay, I have uh, another one here. Um, how are two-spirit identities compensated from an employment equity perspective? Yeah, so you did you did send me this one ahead of time, um, and I was thinking about it, and I'm not really sure because I don't work a lot in HR, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure how um, that is handled. I'm sure that if you're like an indigenous organization, um, obviously try to include two-spirit people in your hiring process because we are an integral part of our indigenous community and we need to be heard and understood, uh, respected and included within our community, um, within all aspects. So um, yeah, just, you know, if you want to be inclusive and diverse, then two-spirit people, you know, it's kind of like, uh, once again, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's like kind of just checking a box, but you know, two-spirit people, we do suffer from a lot of, uh, uh, economic disparities so you know two-spirit people do need jobs in this capitalist hellscape so <laughs> i'm sure people understand the grind you know yeah you don't have to ask me just things about two-spirit too if you have some questions about our our anishinaabe worldview and other things and that and then that's fine too just kind of open it a little more broadly. Once again, I'm just, I'm still, I'm still just a knowledge seeker. So a lot of ways I see myself when coming to culture, I'm still, I'm still in that baby stage because it took me a while to get to it because it was, um, it was a lot more Christianity when I was growing up young. So as, as I kind of aged into my teenagers and now I'm in my early twenties, um, I'm just kind of coming to it. So I'm still in that early stage. And that's where a lot of a lot of indigenous people are. So um, just be be kind with indigenous people. Don't try and berate us with too many questions, especially if you're just meeting them and you didn't even offer me a smoke. Like <laughs> that's that's the real traditional way of asking Anishinaabe people questions about 
culture and spirit and other things you know you give them uh that tobacco you usually give them a tie you might even just have some in your hand right and you can give it to them but that's a that's a nishinaabe way of uh sort of it's about reciprocal relationships right you don't just um ask people without um uh offering them something in return and that's where that uh that tobacco comes in so yeah you got anything else uh, or just comments even if you don't have a question everybody's shy pardon oh i mean what you go uh because uh trying to say thank you in as many languages as i know so well thank you very much again for um coming today and taking the time and it was a very amazing presentation um yeah, so really appreciate it. Um, our um, next talk is November 23rd, and it's going to be on sexual health and the media. Um, so register online, in person, either or. And that's all we have. <laughs>